Recording is on. All right, so today's April 11, 2021, and uh, we'll continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinction Nadi. Um, where do you want to start today? Uh, were there any, we, we were going full gusto last time. <laughs> yeah. Let's well, try to pick yeah. it up from there, or does somebody else have some other questions or? I mean, I don't. I don't mind continuing the topic of uh, transgenderism. On well, we were talking also about we were oh, talking yeah. about gender fluidity. We yeah. were talking about we were talking about differences between. I'm, I'm the only two women in this meeting, and a lot of a lot of the the talks are uh, by men about men. And sometimes I find I'm on. I told you last week where I left it. I said this is very alien. What do I have to say? Today I'm too tired to talk. I didn't sleep well. But I mean, I, d I don't know. I don't know what to think about this. Um, sometimes <laughs> the aliens have landed. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Gary, Gary didn't turn up, did he? You know, we were going through his list. I think yeah. we got about two right. questions from That's his right. list. No, Gary. I was talking to Gary by messaging, and he said he couldn't. He couldn't turn up today. It was. It was, it was enough with everything on Reddit, so he was going to wait. He's <laughs> <laughs> already overloaded. <laughs> I can understand because it's. Uh, Did it you takes see the a long time to recover from all the things that you read? It takes a long time. Oh, it, it takes. It, 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 I'm. I'm serious. It's not. You know. It does take a. A lot. It depends on how you react. But my my type of person, um, everything takes a long time to pro to, first to process, then to understand, then to emotionally uh, everything, and then and then it 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 makes you very tired, and then you're you get very distressed, and then you have to put it back into other. You know, it's it's a whole thing. It's not just okay. I'm going to read a post on Reddit. It's really oh, it's great, and we're going to laugh. No, no, no. It goes much deeper for me. Uh, then you know, so I can understand Gary too. Did you uh, see the post that I did on the Ising spin model and those kind of? What? Which one, Hugh? The Ising spin spin model. There was yes. uh, when, but, um, I'm probably behind shoot. some of the ones that I wanted to watch. Is that recent? Mm, a few days ago, I saw. Yeah. It. Um, no, I haven't read that one yet. I didn't get to it, but I know it's an it's a good one. Yeah. It's one of yeah. 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 I've a lot, there's a lot to. Mm -mm. There, there's really a lot in that kind of thing. There, there mm -hmm. was somebody there that responded in, on that one and said that they, they were doing um, I don't know, a paper on it or something like that, and, uh, or some something in college, and so. I thought, oh, I really like to talk to them about it because because that's the whole subject is kind of crucial for activism and a movement and just just in general. And I that spin model it answers so much about you know basic questions that people struggle with, like why is there um, polarization in the states. Why is there a two-party system? Why are there Republicans and Democrats? Why is there left and right? And and the most important thing with that is symmetry breaking. Because uh, what ultimately what what it is is that we need to you know if we have any chance as a species we need to break symmetry. So everything is homeostatic, it tends towards, you know, conservatism. And I, I believe um, it goes so deep that I think we've got two brain hemispheres because of that. It's to stop us going off on, you know, wild goose chases. So Ian McGilchrist has a different view. He thinks we have two brain hemispheres because one is detailed oriented and one is, you know, wide lens. It's more macro oriented. But I think that that is true, but I think the macro lens that he sees is because the four he's that's the four um older brain layers that i would say and the tightly focus um tight focus you know left hemisphere 
is really because it's dominated by the alien cortex and it's looking in frames. So he he sees that there's you know this procrastian perceptual frame, and then he's saying, well, that's a narrow focus. Um, and then you know the wide focus and generalized perception and stuff is you know your other four layers. Um, but I think it's um, it's more than that. It's a, it's I see it in terms of the five brain layers, and then in the split. Uh, the split is very interesting because mammals up to about dogs and things like that, they don't have a split brain. It starts to split um, with primates, and then it's very, very pronounced with with us. And no one has a good theory for why it is split. Um, the corpus callosum is the bit that connects the two hemispheres, and that's that's uh, where most of the brain traffic is going through those two hemispheres. So there's this kind of mystery for neurologists is why do we have two brain hemispheres and then masses of traffic going along this connection? And I think the reason is explained in the Ising spin model. So um, is if any of this is interesting to people, then, then I'll go in deeper. But the it's crucial from the point of view of where we headed in, in terms of collapse, because the whole thing like XR is trouble now, any movement uh, is, is struggling to get beyond this kind of deadlock where both sides are in deadlock with each other. And, you know, we're kind of a, in, in this deadly embrace that unless we break it, we won't be able to make a turn sharp enough to, to avoid extinction, I don't think. But, uh, you know, the mystery of how to break deadlock is, is really in that Ising Spid model. So you could go through hours and hours of that. But, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know of a good way to just compress it and explain to people how they're going to sleep. But this, this, the key to what Roger Hallam is trying to do, what all these organizations is, are trying to do, is is uh, I don't think they really even know it. They think if you just pull harder, you can get everybody together, but that's not not possible. Um, and it's it, and if you play with that Ising Spoon model, you'll see um, what uh, why. Uh, it, just to, in a nutshell, what it is is it, every action you do has an op equal and opposite reaction. It's kind of like Newton's third law, and that, that's first law. And, and that oh, third law, third law is it? Yeah. Third law. Okay. So, so Newton said like, is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Um, and so, you know that uh, kind of deadlock that things get into, or you know this kind of reactionary thing where people, you know, push and then they get a reactionary response and then it goes nowhere. It, um, is I think. Um, it was an evolutionary strategy that kept us, you know, conservative. It pays for primates and a species to be creative, um, not get into a kind of neurosis, just a kind of closed loop. But it also means that uh, we don't go off on a tangent. We don't go off on a wild goose chase. And you can see all of this, how, how it works out in, say, the decision-making process of, say, bees and things like that, hymenoptera, when they... When bees go to find a new hive, they send out scouts in all directions, 360 degrees. And they, the scouts all come back and they all say, you know, in, with a waggle dance, um, you know, how, how good their new home was. Whatever they discovered, they, they get excited and try and communicate that. But you can see if one of them got overly excited about a shitty... <laughs> <laughs> discovery the whole hive would you know it's, it, it basically you dominated by by the the long tail you see that does that make any sense is when the imagine they all radiate out find a bunch of different uh, potential new hives when they all come back if you looked at it um just just graphed out the preference of each one of those new places to go to you would find it is a bell curve you know, the majority would be okay. There would be some good ones, you know, in the on the long tails, and there'd be some shit ones on the long tails. So 
what the hive does is they try to avoid the, the long tails and get the you know the mean of the best and the way that's done is um, sort of like an ising spin, spin model is uh, you know they will have the the bees compete you know the waggle dance uh, is kind of a competition that results in a kind of uh, conservative conservatism so the beehive is best not going for the optimum height, but going going for the safest. And I think that primates are doing the same thing. Is so nobody goes off and says, you know, I think we should, you know, do a lemming thing and go off and <laughs> crazy our shit. Um, immediately, someone else. You know, not only do we have that, you know, in one hem one brain brain hemisphere, we'll come up with a crazy ass plan, but we will second guess ourselves with the other brain hemisphere, even within our own heads. But in terms of a collective, we'll also do that. And you can see it if you go and make any kind of um, proposition. If you if you come with a thesis, somebody automatically will come with an antithesis. And then like, you know, this is, Hegel said this is the Hegelian dialectic. And then from the, you know, thesis, antithesis emerges the synthesis. And then the synthesis is kind of a merger of the two or the kind of the the logical conclusion from those two and then you know from this the synthesis then becomes a thesis for another antithesis and that's how it's supposed to go and then ken wilbur says yeah and it all goes around spiral you know keeps on repeating itself but keeps on moving forward slightly so he came out and said it's not a circular it's spiral you know it does move forward although it keeps on going and that's where he gets his spiral dynamics from but um in terms of where we at as a species, is we have to get over that. We have, we, you know, if we, if, say, Extinction Rebellion puts forward a thesis like we all screwed, they will naturally get an antithesis, which is our ah, climate change is bunk, and the guys will deny it. And, stuff. and and by the time we we in an unusual situation that we're not evolved to handle, and that's the by the time we reach a consensus or you know, people react, they would be reacting to pain. And there isn't enough time. By the time people react uh, in pain to the situation we, we're heading for, it'll be too late. It's one of the things, it's a strange situation that we're not, uh, we not, we never really faced in our history because we never really came to a thing where you had to predict it far in advance and react when there was just, just, really intellectual evidence, really kind of circumstantial, which is, that's circumstantial evidence is really what we face and it's it with uh, with climate change. So, <clears throat> so people normally react to emotion. And this is one thing where by the time we actually are feeling the emotion, it'll be too late. It probably is too late already. But anyway, you know, we have to carry on as if it isn't. And so these movements come up and then they think, well, we'll persuade everybody and then but what they're doing is what I mentioned before is if you imagine it like a bus uh, we're heading towards the cliff it wouldn't matter if we went right or left it would be better than where we're going which is straight ahead and so these organizations like Extinction Rebellion say oh we have to pull the wheel left and there are just as many people on the right to so say well we have to pull it right and then basically they stay there until there's a symmetry breaking moment and so the the only way to actually accomplish anything is by doing a symmetry breaking movement and that's what an arg is designed to do so if you if you imagine like things like larping and stuff and uh, role playing is you you pretend to be left so you pull on the left hand side and then basically you know you'll get an equal number of people on the opposite side but you really have kind of a false flag pulling on the left and you say like okay now we let go <laughs> And then you'll get it to go over to the right. Either one, you can break break symmetry by pretending. So, but if everybody's kind of blind and at the same level, and they're all pulling their own way, all egotistically, then um, you know we will stay going straight ahead, more or less. And so, yeah. So, but the reason for that uh, left-right divide is is uh, is explained when, uh, uh, with a, a spin model, a magnetic spin model. Does, does anybody understand what that spin model is? Do you want me to go um, into it? I'll have to read into it, but I think 
uh, as an idea. Um, there's a lot of um, real life examples already, right? Like, um, like as you said, ARGs. And then actually this weekend, I saw a movie in Netflix that had a similar, I mean, there's like, a, it's called, um, it's, are you aware of uh, Eric Andre? And his- Oh, it rings a bell. What, what did he do? He's, our, his, he does um, talk shows with like um, kind of oh. B-level celebrities, but his, his uh, premise is instead of, uh, you know how talk shows are very formalized and they have a, a script, he, his aim is to be the worst talk show host. So he does really out of out there stuff, random things. And, and I think, yeah, his latest movie has that kind of um, symmetry breaking aspects of it. Um, so I, I see that in real life. He goes to like, he, he made a trip from Florida all the way to New York. And he, he just, it's basically doing pranks, but um, he meets up with random people. So he, he doesn't care who he interacts with. So he went to a bar where there's a lot of uh, rednecks or, you know, conservative types, and he tries to push their buttons. But if there's any time where it gets to, um, like someone's about to beat him up, he always says, oh no, um, I'm just I'm just doing a movie. Or yeah, don't, uh, don't hurt me. It's just, it's just an act, it's just an act. And so, yeah, so that's kind of like when people learn that it's just an act, they lower down their guard and they say, oh, um, okay, yeah, you, you got me, man. I didn't know that you're, it was just an act. And so he does that with different people. And yeah, I, 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 I see the power in, in that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of like Sacha Baron Cohen. He also does uh, it. Yeah, him too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But what it is, is absurdism. So it's, uh -huh. a, it's an old art. I mean, it's the art of the fool, right? So, you know, is um, the counterbalance to the king, which is really hyper rational is uh, is the absurd so that's the role of the fool it's a kind of sacred role and it's it's to protect the sanity of the of the kingdom um and then uh, yeah i've said before that our problem is we don't have any fools we don't well, we don't have enough so so we have all these hyper rational psychopaths <laughs> and we don't have enough counterbalances to them and even even the 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 fools the the people that are supposed to play the roles of the fools you know like the comedians and stuff a lot of them are conservative even though they they kind of extreme centrist so there, there's there's nobody that wants to undermine the whole project the whole civilization project you don't really see that there's i don't see i can't think of anybody that it I mean, except maybe, you know, Robert Anton Wilson and those those guys, but those guys are all dead now. <laughs> I don't know of anybody that's that's really holding a mirror up to the whole civilization project. The guys that are against it, like, um, you know, Deep Green Resistance and stuff, they're very, very serious guys. They are. <laughs> I wish they had a comedic side to you. Yeah. yeah, there's no mischief in them this, <laughs> and stuff. And so, so... Yeah, it's it's a it's a very dangerous time. I hope that you know more enlightened people will emerge and that, that get it because it, it is a an ancient role. <laughs> just that, uh, I'm not really sure why more people are not stepping up to it. Um, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, I, I wanted to uh, yeah that I wanted to just mention that Isaac Spin model because it. If you can understand that spin model and uh, just understand kneeling processes, then you can really understand uh, complex social organization. I, I, I don't understand how people can be called sociologists and that if they don't understand the physics of things like a spin model, because it, it is the exact complexity that, that we, we're talking about. So. Yeah, I, I put a, a lot of store on it. I'm not sure why more people don't get it. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then you see the the thing about these uh, really polarized 
domains that are really in deadlock is they are sub subject, uh, you know, like swing voters know this, that the real power is in the swing vote because everybody pushes from one side or the <laughs> left or right. And what it means is the guys in the middle have all the power. And that that's traditionally, you know, people have realized that everybody from like Napoleon to Hitler, the divide and conquer strategy is as, is as old as the hills. So everybody knows that if you put, uh, put everybody at loggerheads, then, you know, as the decider, you you have all the power. But it it means that you, the butterfly effects and stuff, that uh, you means that you can change the evolution of a complex system. But um, if, you see, if there's more than one p uh, player in the middle ground that's trying to destabilize the system, then you... You kind of have to go to go to battle <laughs> for for who's going to actually tip it in in which way. So the guys in in the neutral middle ground is where the most intense but subtle battle is going on. The guys on each wing are all kind of gross and you know, hey, dude, get in there and put the wheel on. <laughs> that's why it's <laughs> like, important to you know. to get rid of labels, right? That's that's pretty much neutrality. You're not one way or the other. Well, you see, or, the advantage, one of the advantages of not uh, having an ego or a label is mean, means that you're very fluid. So you could you can mimic the other side. And, and that's the key is really mimicry. I mean, I think of all these people as, as insane. And the, the way to get through to insane people is through mimicry. You have to start, you know, kind of speaking their language and doing that. When they identify with you, th then you can shift them. You know, it's, uh, I, I mentioned in one of the posts this week, there's, uh, it's, it's incredible what people will do for, um, for imitation, in terms of imitation. If they identify with, with you, they will, they will imitate you. And that's... And the, actually, the reason why that came up was actually something that came out of last week about transgender. So, so Mike posted a thing on anarchism and got banned for it. But what it was just a troll post. But the you see what those guys are saying on anarchism is say, well, if you're trans, it's just you know happens. You know, people are. You know, loads and loads of people are trans. It's it's um, you know it's na it's nature. It's not nurture, and so you know they're claiming all this kind of neutrality and pretending that it's not a cultural fad. So they're saying, well, the reason why there's suddenly an epidemic of people trans people now is not because of culture. It's just because now people are free uh, to actually express that, and you know, the, and it's it's not it can't be true. Uh, because you can see the bias, and you can you can also have a look at some of the statistics. Like if you have a look at some of the papers on on things like uh, copycat suicides, uh, they there's clear evidence that there's there's masses of influence. If if somebody like a celeb commits suicide, there'll be a spike in suicides of people with the same gender, the same uh, age. Uh, they basically. The shorthand is people that identify with that celeb. So the fact that celebs are coming out and changing gender means that it must have an impact. And you can also show that trans people, I think, 40% of them attempt suicide. And so you, there's there's a correlation between you know suicide and identification and uh, dysphoria and that, those kind of psychological things. So I think it's 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 an impossible claim to say that. The doctors and the medical profession and the culture is biasing people towards, you know, transgender and, and gender dysphoria, and without without realizing it, in the name of freedom and the name the name of understanding and tolerance, they they actually providing a fertile ground for influence. With and they won't recognize it because if if they recognize that they're biased. Then, then it implies that they have to move closer towards intolerance. And so, in the, in the name of tolerance, they've they've gotten themselves stuck, and the victims are are the kids. But yeah, uh, so you know that that uh, kind of shows up in an in an Ising spin spin model is 
but if yeah the the powerful thing though the 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 whole thing that you can get out of this is is really the power of, of mimicry and so the reason why movements try to get hold of sebs and try and get them on their side is because uh you know people are not really following the celebs they're mimicking them and that's the power of a of a cult is that uh you know you get a close uh close-knit group of people with this with like-minded ideas they automatically fence themselves off and put up barriers so that you don't get any outside influences it means that you're only influenced in that domain and then they will start copying each other then the cult leader can change the the culture because it's it's only got a, a small group so yeah is, is is any of this interesting because I'll go deeper. I'll carry on on this line if it is, but otherwise we can change the subject if it's not relevant to anybody. No, it's it's okay. It's it's interesting. Where are you going? Oh, you I, well, I, I, I'm going about how to actually get cultural change. So yeah. the yeah. whole thing about Roger Hallerman and then the thing that was a obsessing Gail Bradbrook. She says, you know, what's the code for ch cultural change? Well, there, if you're a CEO or you know um, any kind of uh, leader in the military or something, you, everybody knows that cultural change is one of the hardest things to do, especially for a CEO. CEO comes along, takes over a company or something, and then you know the company is going in the wrong direction. The old CEO is booted. The new CEO comes along and he has to change the culture. Now, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. There's so much inertia in culture, that, and it's it's deliberate. There again, there's evidence that we've evolved to be conservative and not to do anything too radical. And and so people really, really resist. Um, they resist a new CEO coming over. They, they will pay lip service, but they'll generally just you know keep their heads below the parapet and just just really dig in with quiet um you know quite obstinance so i i remember that that happened to jimmy carter he was he was a legendary case of that um and what what happened to jimmy carter is he came in with all this radical change he was gonna <laughs> you know he jimmy carter was actually a very very radical president people don't realize that now because he never accomplished much but what what happened was he took over the administration and they sandbagged him. He, he, he didn't understand cultural inertia. So he, uh, he, Jimmy Carter is a classic case of, of um, not understanding human psychology. And so in, in the name of kind of, I'll give you an example, in the name of kind of democracy and trying to be a nice guy and an everyman, then he did things like, oh, well, when he, you walk into the room, which where, when a US president walks into a room, then they play you know, a hail to the chief. And then immediately hail to the chief strikes up. Everybody knows, oh, they stop talking and then they turn around and look at look at the guy coming through the door. And then that establishes the, you know, that's the lead in to everybody's mimicry in that meeting. They, they start reflecting that person, all their mirror neurons going. So Jimmy Carter was like a Democrat. And he said, oh, this is all bloody authoritarian. He says, no, you're not going to play hail to the chief when I walk in. So he would walk into a room and no one would notice. And he, he couldn't get everybody's attention. And, <laughs> and he learned the hard way why all these guys learned to do these kind of uh, rituals like hell to the chief. But in, in, in all his, his kind of changes, he did match the same kind of thing. And then what he found in the end was the, the administration just got obstinate and they just waited for him to leave. So he couldn't get anything done. His own administration just sandbagged him. He couldn't get anything executed. He couldn't, he, he wasn't the leader anymore. He was kind of like a hostage in his own, in, in the Oval Office. And so, it, you know, that's, that's where, where you get to when you don't understand human psychology. But, okay, now, if Jimmy Carter was a complete psychopath, kind of like the last one, <laughs> the 45 what uh what the psychopaths do and they they don't learn this in business school or uh, psychology that they, they they find this out for themselves naturally but they divide they divide a group and then well that division then allows them to be the pivot so then they they can be the decider and so um that's 
that's how most uh, leaders actually wield power. But okay, so now let me go into in detail why why this is. When the Isaac spin model in detail. So let, let me tell you what it is, in case you didn't <laughs> didn't see it. So so in any model, let's say like a political landscape. Let's call that a, a domain, right? Um, or let's call it a field. So you say like the American electorate. You draw a big fence around it and say what well, they have n number of people, and you just say you start off where everybody's an independent thinker. They, nobody has any ideologies. This is the first time you know you're going to have an election or anything like that. So the way that's modeled is saying let's say that everybody's political orientation is you know like a compass needle and so you know say if you you know if you right wing you'd be oriented north and if you left wing you'd be oriented south and then you've got these you know compass needles you know thousand and one for each photo you you were say in a 2d plane you would you would model the, the entire electorate like that so now what happens and why do you get from that which is a complete random everybody's pointing in random directions how do you get to that to a two-party system. Well, the way it happens is exactly the way it happens in, say, a metal. Uh, to, to make a metal random, make all the orientations uh, random, is you just heat it up. So if you if you heat up metal, you get to a point where it passes its Curie point, and every there's no none of the um, none of none of the well, its electrons actually are in alignment. So each one of the electrons will be in a random direction and moving around. What happens when you bring the temperature of a metal down, which is kind of what happens when you know you make a country, uh, gradually the the emergence of a two-party system is kind of like the population cooling down. It is very closely mimicked to that. So so as the as the cooling effect comes down then what you find is imagine these uh say two compass needles here's one and here's another uh two the ones that are closest to each other uh, actually you know compromise and then actually form a parallel arrangement so they actually make a coalition so if if two are closely aligned they'll compromise and just you know you'll wind up in the 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 you know, average of the two. Now, when you've got two like that, that becomes quite a much stronger domain and double the strength that they were before. So then the third and fourth and surrounding needles, then they also will try, you know, they have more probability of orienting in the same direction or an average of the surrounding. Uh, does that make sense? So you have two that because they lined up, they're stronger. So then the same applies. The next uh, the next one, the neighboring compass needles, they'll also line up in an average between the two. So an average, so basically these will have two thirds of the force, and this one will have one third of the force, and the average between the two thirds and one third will so that they will wind, wind up being oriented, say, in a third direction. Then those three then now become a much more powerful force, and they then they can capture you know the next layer, and that's how it goes. So then you say, well, how does this wind up? Well, if you keep on going through the steps, so it's really a kind of Markov chain, I think. But each one each one of those those steps that's happening all over the place, and the things that are most closely aligned make a coalition. So it's kind of like a voting coalition in in an election. A voting block or something you, you basically people that say well we're almost the same politically we'll just forget our differences and we'll you know align together and then uh that ha happens in more and more areas until you get you know a domain that now you have a big domain with a hundred needles all pointing in the same direction the next domain that is close by that is almost the same, then they compromise and change, and then that's how it goes. And so, so you have what's called domains in in the metal, and they have domain boundaries of you know basically the 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 close neighbors that they can't actually 
um, bring into alignment with themselves. So that so those demands get bigger and bigger, and as you go, it takes longer and longer for them to actually form, um, you know, bigger and bigger pools. So it, ta it takes them longer and longer to get coalitions. And finally, the final thing you get, you normally wind up, if you play with those models a while, you'll see that the final thing is you get two domains that are really opposed and they cannot defeat each other. They do eventually defeat each other, but or oh, one of them overrides the other one, but it takes an extraordinarily long time and it might never happen. And then, but it's, it's very common to, you know, to have one domain, like half of the, of those compass needles in one orientation and half in the other. And that, that's uh, semi-stable because they can't actually, you know, uh, bring in either one can defeat the other one. And that's kind of like Republican and Democrats. So at some point of cooling, you, you get this kind of solidification like that. So the only, the only way to change the orientation or the fastest way to change it is to heat it all up again and break all the coalitions and then bring the temperature down again. You'll get a new configuration. But uh, yeah, the, the the first you know there's a lot of frustration i think in the america now because the you know the country is completely polarized and you know, people think well why can't we all work together and stuff and well it's, it's kind of it's annealed in that direction you what you you uh, that that is a, a quite a stable state and it will stay stay for quite a long time so this yeah did I explain that at all? I got it. But I do have a question about um, earlier you said that a strategy might be to kind of try to break the symmetry. So if, if the ARG is going to do that, um, does that mean that all the projects of the ARG or whatever they call the games must um, favor one side because if it's just random and sometimes it favors, uh, you know, one side and then the other, then it's not consistently breaking the symmetry. Um, and also, I think it's in relation to those creation of the cults because the cults are breaking away from, say, that the two party or the two sides. So the more cults there are that try to break away from the two cults um it'll take longer to to get into the breaking of the two um how how do we kind of account for that must the must the arg concentrate on just swinging it the one way so that the one way is defeated or that so that it goes left or it goes right um so the the, the okay, this is subtle, but imagine the, all the needles facing uh, different d directions and starting to form up into domains. If you say, well, you know, the arc should just force it in one direction or the other, so pick a direction, so try and make it go towards the left. You're just another needle. As soon as as soon as you do that, you will get your corresponding reaction. So what an arg is, is, is really the next evolution. It's another meta layer on top of all the needles. So imagine, you see, the needles, just they're just dumb and kind of like the electric. They all just have an orientation that's like their ego. So let's, let's call their native orientation is their ego. So if you just come in with an ego, somebody else's ego will react against yours and neutralize it. What an what an arg is doing, or what a cult is doing, like this is is a, an enlightened needles. So these needles have a brain, <laughs> and so they actually neutral. So you see, if you have a neutral needle, then you can actually swing it any way, uh, you know, to break to break the symmetry. So so then imagine it as the needle is just faking its magnetism. So if you in this company you fake your magnetism that way if you're in that company you fake your, your magnetism the other way 
you just carry on doing that for with two aims one of them is the internal aim of getting people over their ego so getting people that actually have a brain and don't just orient themselves randomly <laughs> according to the ego so if you get people transcending the ego you get this new meta layer that, that kind of supervenes over all these dumb asses so if if you have that then then you say, well, which way do you make it break? Well, if very care, you have to be very careful to make sure that you don't decide. You have to kind of trust that the ultimately the whole system is really pivoted on a feather. So it's really pivoted on kind of like a butterfly's wing. And if you you basically take everybody, make sure that the orientation is so neutral that that when you you know butterflies wing moment happens everybody that has intelligence will swing rapidly so then you swing out of out of dead so um okay that it must must be hard to understand did, did that make any sense yes i got it we have to okay. trust that the needles have brains <laughs> yeah but you see the really really brainy needles they they try and stay on the razor's edge it's it's like you know, desiderati extinction, uh, the desiderata number five, right? Is, is, is if you get loads and loads of people on the razor's edge, and then, you know, it doesn't matter. Either somebody will say, break right, break left. <laughs> They'll all, and it, it'll look like magic. It's like, where did that magnetism <laughs> come from? It's like, well, it came from the ether, it came out of. Yeah. Right. And it's also not, like you said, not trying to control the outcome. It's just um, mirroring and serving as the mirror and yeah. trusting that what needs to happen yeah, it, will happen. Yes, it's, it's, it's really having a, um, a higher order. In, so if you think of the two-dimensional plane as the basic order where all the ego goes about. So if, if you have people on a higher order, enough people on a higher order, they can move very quickly in, in any direction. But they just need to accumulate more and more people on the higher order layer. Um, so that, they, you know, all, all, the, all the dumbasses will follow. So think of it, okay, let's try and ground it in some more concrete example. If everybody got over their ego, and you had a cult where everybody, you know, that was the aim to get over your ego and be enlightened. You still got people that are like Christians and Muslims and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, that that can change on a dime. You know, basically you snap your fingers and that all that, you know, it can become a cultural norm so that anybody comes out with Christian shit or Jude Judaism or, you know, any kind of stuff like that. You, Instantly, it'll become the norm to just say, shut the fuck up with that stupid shit. And people go, whoa, I, I can't be a Christian. No, you can't. Shut up. <laughs> and it'll be like, oh, okay. <laughs> and that's all it takes to get rid of Christianity. But you see, it, it can only happen when, when you have a number of people. You see, if you start off doing what I say, if, you, if everybody said like, we need a bunch of people to start pulling this way and be like with Richard Dawkins and get the atheists because atheists are going to save us because Christianity is bad and stuff. It's like, no, you've just got a, you know, atheist here. You'll get the creationists. They'll be, it's not, what you need is somebody to say like, okay, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and you fly under a false flag until basically you you know everybody on the meta layer and they're not in a way are you a fake christian yeah <laughs> so like how far are we to bring this down i uh, keep it going so where 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 you get is to 50 percent. you get 50 percent basically infiltration into the domain is is very common i'll, I'll tell you 50 percent would be just a raw scatter gun you can be a lot smarter than that but 50% then would be a tipping point if you just did a random scatter gun. And then when everybody goes, say, are you ready to end this game? And then be like, yeah. <laughs> and then you just, okay, new mode. <laughs> Cut the bullshit mode. And all the other 50% would just go along. That's human nature, the bandwagon effects. You, you wouldn't, you see, if, you, if you're a Christian, you're a sheep. You, you, nobody... Woke up in the morning, decided that they were a Christian, and you know when they were three years old, they were indoctrinated into it. So it means that they 
they are easily indoctrinated and they go with the flow. If the flow snaps on them rapidly, <laughs> that's it. They'll change just as rapidly. So yeah, they'll have a one or two questions. So you can't, you know, but you know, the people will adopt a new mode very quickly if they are in a cult. So if they identify with everybody in that cult. So so I mean I say say the Pope came out one day and said, like, okay, you know what? This Christian thing and this Catholic thing, it's a shit, this has been horrendous. So we're going to stop it now. So, you know, and then explain the deal. I'm telling you, Catholics would, would pack it in overnight. <laughs> and the, the same applies to, to everybody. So, but now it doesn't have to be 50% because what, what are these... These social networks, they scale free networks. What they mean is they have Pareto distribution. It means that, you know, 20% of the nodes have 80% of the connections. So if there's a power law and you'll, you'll find that 20% uh, of, the, of the nodes are controlling the other 80%. The other 80% don't have enough connections or enough weights to, to actually set the beat uh, in, in, in other words. So, if you can find those 20% nodes, you the 20% can control the 80%. What's really interesting is, because it's scale-free, the 20% also, it's the same rule. 20% of the 20% is also controlling the 20%. So you can go, you know, keep on going down the road until eventually you find some guy in Poughkeepsie who's controlling the whole world. <laughs> So the, those those guys that um, yeah you see the the reason yeah I mean the general way people think of influencers is they fooled by appearances so they think you know the guy on center stage they think is the guy who's the big influencer it's not true it's the the really powerful people now we're talking about being neutral remember how i was saying we'd be neutral the real power is in that kind of neutrality well it's the eminence greece the the gray cardinals behind the big man the big man is a fool he's always a fool <laughs> he's always an idiot it's the guys who control the fool they are the powerful ones because they can outlive the fool they can get rid of him <laughs> they, can, they can do anything but all all the sheep they look at this fool and so, so anybody that knows anything tries to be, you know, the the controller of the fool. So they try to be king makers. Nobody, nobody with a brain would try and be a king. So the it, you get you get uh, situations like throughout history, like say the king, the one of the one of the most powerful positions in in a monarchy like Britain was the master of the stool. <laughs> <laughs> now, stool means shit. It means shit. It means master of the shit. <laughs> you say, like, how can the master of the shit be one of the most powerful positions in England? Well, the master of the stool was the guy who, like, helped the king take a shit. You know, he'd wipe his ass and stuff like that. He would basically go into the privy chamber, into the toilet with the king, you know, basically sit there, you know, holding the you know, and not toilet roll. They didn't have toilet roll in those days. But but we generally, you know, basically attend to the king while he's taking a crap and then wipe his ass for him afterwards. Now, why was that <laughs> such a powerful position? Because because if you're such an intimate with the king and you you can sit there for hours, and I mean, when the king wants, wants a little break from all these assholes at court, then he can go and, you know, the only privacy he gets is on on the can. So he goes and sits in the can there just trying to get a bit of privacy. And then the you know the the master of the privy stool would be would have him there privately. And he could just on the basis of just having a wee chat, he could have tremendous influence on the king. So 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 you know, people I mean in more enlightened times, then people fought, fought fiercely for that position of master of the privy stool. Nowadays, we're all dumbed down to oblivion. So now <laughs> people are not so subtle, and now they think, oh, you know, it's I've got to be the lead. I've got to be the center stage. No, that's the stupidest position of all. So they were much, much wiser in times past. We've, we've dumbed down incredibly. But, yeah, I, I hope that, you know, 
gives you some color on if if you the lever behind the lever if you believe uh, so in other words if you have one of the the the, the small preferential nodes that nobody notices so in other words okay let's take the scale free network if you take the 20% of the nodes and 20% of those nodes then then you can still go another and then 20% of those and then at at some stage you find well this this node is really really important might be the king or not but but uh, there's one degree removed from that and it's you know you'll have five or six nodes that have maybe only one connection and they if they work together they can control that master node so do you okay you see what i mean because if you looked at the network you would look if you if you were a dumbass and you just looked at the network and how it was connected you would look at this preferential node and you'd say oh this is the node that controls the entire network uh, and, be, and the reason you'd say it is because there's this big node hyper connected and you wouldn't notice that there were like five or six little you know nodes that were connected you know with one graph with, with you know um, with one edge so they basically they would just have you know one connection to the master node and you'd say well those are not important well yeah but imagine if they worked together so in other words if if the master node, so the king, had five gray cardinals, and they all worked in concert. So they basically, they all made sure they gave the same input to the king. Now, the king is kind of a quorum, uh, quorum sensing. He's got a like a quorum sensing algorithm. So he, he just takes the information that's coming through, and he says, okay, it looks like the majority thinks this, but if five people work together that are close connected to the king, they can make him feel that, you know, they can bias the king because they he feels that, you know, these five are overrepresented in terms of, he doesn't know the five are working together, right? So, okay, I, I feel like I'm not explaining this very well. But, okay, I'll give you another example. So I knew a guy in, the, in America, he, he actually mentored me for a long while. Um, and he, he, um, he was one of these preferential nodes. And so I, I looked very closely at what he did and um, uh, his name was Tom. So I, I, I looked at him closely and I, I saw that he, you know, what he did was very important. If he said something, he would have tremendous influence in Washington and in certain sectors in the healthcare industry and stuff. So I wondered, you know, so many people wanted to influence him and stuff. And I, I said, I wondered what he did. So I watched him carefully. And I, I, saw that I, I saw that he seemed to have a pattern. And the pattern was if he got, you know, if he found something was really important information, he would sit on it. But if he heard it from three different sources that he trusted, that would tip him and he would start propagating the information. So... So I said to him one day that I said, you know, is that what you're doing? And he said, yeah, you, you nailed me. How did you, how did you know? I said, well, I just watch you. And I, I could see that you were doing this pattern. So, so I said to him, well, did you know that more important than the stuff that you actually propagate, if you actually do the math, <laughs> do, do some network modeling, you'll see that, that he has a preferential node, right? If he takes, the input from say three people before he prog propagates that if that's his rule for propagating information uh it's actually not as powerful in terms of the effect on the network as blocking three people so so if there was three uh bits of information that that uh that he he broke his rule and decided not to propagate that would ha ultimately have more effect on the network than actually propagation so in other words, as a filter, as a block, is more powerful than, than actually uh, just a transmitter. So the and so yeah, when when I told him that, he was kind of blown away, and he he came back later and said, yeah, it's, he thinks that I was right. But the the but yeah, it, it gives you an idea of. I hope what I'm doing is I'm giving you an idea of how to be a subtle node in network and how, how to actually ferment change. So the, the thing is to actually recruit neutra neutrality 
and and get uh, in a position where where people are at a fulcrum, you know, but in the kind of gray zone. The the most interesting stuff happens in the neutral gray zone. That's where all the action is. Now, you know, most people think it's all in the limelight. It's not. There's all there's almost no action in the limelight because it's already preordained. It's it, the by the time things get to the limelight and all the big heroes and stuff, they've already been decided. So those people in the limelight are not decision makers. But but the world thinks they are because they don't understand <laughs> how this stuff works. Now, this is not only in social networks. Uh, this is also in your brain. So, you know, the reason why they say, well, there's no free will because, you know, they can look in an fMRI scan, they can look at uh, your brain, and they can tell how a decision is made seven seconds. Seven seconds before you think you've made that decision. Why? Because your alien cortex is like uh, the 20% preferential <laughs> notes, if you like. And so by the time it tips over and it, it thinks, well, I'm, I'm in the, you know, I'm in the limelight. So I'm the king. You know, the king made the decision. No, the decision was made all, you know, by, by all the people behind the king and the key players. And in particular, the key players that were uh, kind of enlightened. So in other words, that weren't, weren't playing the same game as everybody else. Everybody else kind of imagined it as an ego game where they're all butting heads. And these guys are not butting heads. They don't have a line to push. So the power, most powerful position of all is if you don't have, if, you can, if you're completely amoral, if you, if, you don't, uh, if you don't get stuck into ethics and all these things which, you know, make people tip left or right, is you're saying, you're saying I, you know, you say, nah, it's bullshit. It's in, the, in the absolute neutrality in the gray area, uh, why is where all the action is? Why, why the action is there is, is because that's the most subtle thing. So the people that understand all this and are working at that level, they, they will have titanic battles in the gray zone that's almost like starfish fighting or something. You have to get time-lapse photography or something to see it going on. The average person can't see it because they, they're blinded by the fool in the limelight. So, yeah, but there, there are... Okay, so now that I've introduced you to this, then you can see that behind the scenes, the, the key to the conspiracy theories and stuff is, is there are lots of people that actually know what I'm saying. And, and so they, they duking it out behind the scenes to, you know, before some dope like Biden <laughs> doesn't have two brain cells to rub, rub together. Then it's just like Biden decided this and Biden, but Biden's just a puppet, you know. I mean, not not like people conventionally say. Oh, you know, he's controlled. He's, uh, literally, literally, is controlled by uh, you know people that know how to control people. So yeah. So if you you know you you can see them sometimes, but uh, in general, if they if they're pretty good at playing this game, you won't you won't see the the influence. It's it's very very subtle. So yeah. Hopefully, I've explained to you now what you know why liberals are so wrong when they say, "Oh, it's you know not conspiracy theories and AOCs changing things." <laughs> like, oh, horseshit! <laughs> Absolute horseshit! But all those—they're looking at people that that really have no power, that really really are puppets. So, so yeah, the point of this is not to say, oh, conspiracy. The point is to say, like, this is the secret <laughs> to how enlightened people gain power. So, so okay, take that as another example as well. You know, you can say, well, not only are the people behind the throne uh, not really in power, you can say, well, you know, the whole court, the whole, the whole of Washington and everything is in the limelight. So, so you know as well that basically the real power is outside of Washington. No, nobody in their right mind would go, go, go into the cockpit. So, so yeah, uh, that's how secret organizations work, and that's how you know uh, a powerful cult will work. Um, so, yeah, there's there you go. We did cults one hundred and one. We did a bit of networking. We 
explain, explain how domains work. <laughs> It's pretty nobody listens to these. <laughs> so, yeah, now it, it's 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 difficult because you know so you take somebody like uh, Roger Hallam and Gail Bradley. They, they, uh, yeah, they they kind of like they're not smart enough to listen. <laughs> To, to 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 real influences and they they are clearly influenced by people that that they don't realize yeah so i mean i i, I would say that you know i would i would love to know how they got to meet uh you know chenoweth and erica chenoweth and stuff but i i would presume they were they were coaxed into that <laughs> and the, the aim the aim was was simple it was to make the the organization non-violent and then you know once it was established as a emphatically non-violence uh, organization then then it, be, it becomes a bleed um you know they can bleed off all the passions of the youth and it becomes you know a dumping ground for just a double and they just sidetrack everybody <laughs> and nullify them that way and I, I think that's probably what what happened to exxon hmm. yeah do you think it was also um the money that was like they were given us a seed money from whoever influenced them. So that yeah, the money, the part. money, yeah, the money is it. See, so you can you can always tell where where the money came from. So, um, you see what what the guys do behind the scenes is they they don't start these organizations. They don't you know they like let a thousand poppies grow or whatever. They don't. They wait for them to come up. So. That, so there are lots and lots of people like Roger and Gail, but they will they will watch them and they'll decide which ones suit their purposes best, and then they'll start feeding money to them. So you know it's uh, yeah you you could take them for right old suckers. If if Roger and Gail were were smarter, they could take them for right old suckers because they, again they could do the pretend thing. They could they could basically say we are the absolute goody two shoes perfect thing we'll support the green new deal we'll go for you know green tech and we'll be nonviolent and we'll we'll do the most vanilla protests known to man and then basically they would money would pour into them especially from you know you see Gail in front of HSBC and stuff like that oh god I could make my skin crawl the, but the, the money would pour in if they did that. And then they could do movement building and then turn the movement on a dial. So, so you know, basically it, it would take some skill because you've got to, you know, bring people to that point. But the, it, it's, it's, it's very possible that that kind of uh, seeding organizations and uh, um, can backfire. Can backfire very badly if if the person if if the per you know basically the main guy like Roger Hallam if he's if he's a smart bastard you, they they could whipsaw um, on you. But the the thing is because a movement like XR is is kind of weak. It's ideolo ideologically weak in terms of the Ising spin model. All the compass needles <laughs> all over the haywire. Um, they they are vulnerable to to movement jacking. So. So you know, a more enlightened movement, you know, a more enlightened cult, or they are a cult. I mean, everything is a cult, but a more enlightened cult could could easily gain jack them, and that that happens frequently in revolutions and stuff throughout history. <laughs> right. So it would be yeah, I wouldn't underestimate those organizations. They I think they to some extent do their research. Um, I mean, look at what happened to Greta, right? Isn't she another person that they seeded money? And I'm sure you talked in your videos about Greta too. Yeah, it's that Norwegian guy, whatever his name is, that Norwegian green billionaire. He, he manufactured it out of nothing, out of whole cloth. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it, it is subtle. Yeah, we got to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then basically, you know, after he's finished with it, they put it down. But but just think how dangerous that game is. If 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 they lost control of Greta, 
they they'd be in real trouble. So, yeah, but uh, you know, they they never did. <laughs> but but it's a, yeah, so I think that's possibly the end of the Greta story. She's she's gone back to school and stuff, but she could have become Joan of Arc if they weren't careful. Right. Okay. Interesting stuff. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hope people, you know, at least one or two people out here listen to this kind of stuff and, and wise up uh, enough to, to make a difference. So the, the, the thing is, again, it's not to get any particular outcome. The, the, you don't want to say, oh, you know, the master plan is to make sure the Nazis don't get into power or we make sure that we do green initiatives or something like that. All of those are kind of fool's errands. The, uh, ultimately, you want you must think of it like a birthing process, and you you just a catalyst for to accelerate which way it's actually going to go. So it, you know, even in your own mind, you shouldn't really <laughs> have a desire for the outcome. You just you you just have trust that the the outcome you know would left. To itself, like kind of life will find a way, and you know we kind of team humanity and pro life. And you say if you if you basically provide the lubricant and the catalyst, then then it will break in the in the necessary way. And so you don't <laughs> you're not on any side. You're just on the side of life and humanity. Uh, no no political orientation. It's just a week. It's a week. And anyway, what does it matter? Have you ever found any one of these things that actually work? Any find one ideology, communism, you know, socialism, like national socialism, and that they all don't work because they they partial. And and so if you if you run them to their conclusion, just just try it. Just just do, you can do your own Hegelian dialectic on them, and just do a thought experiment for where they go. And you'll, you'll see it, it goes the same place that every, you know, student argument in a dorm of a few beers gets to at four in the morning. It comes back exactly to the same freaking place it started. <laughs> that's, that's the nature of the logic. It's, it's a closed hermeneutic seal. And so basically it, it will just come out. So you take any, anything, take wokeism or something to its logical conclusion. Take, take, Communism to its logical conclusion, it looks like the opposite. So, so you know, if you if you mention the horseshoe theory of politics, then then especially on the left, people vomit because they 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 love their egos and they like to think that they are on this path to some destination. And you say you're on the same. If you pursue it, you'll wind up in exactly the same place as a libertarian. Yeah, Leah Keith mentioned it. Last week, and I, I was, was so damn pleased. Mm. Yeah, well, I was actually kind of stunned because mm. I, I, the one thing that you I consistently get resistant to is is the horseshoe theory, and it it just seems so damn ob obvious to me. Mm. And it, well, let me say one more thing about that. In so in in terms of the domains, going back to the domains and the Ising model. Okay, now think of it this way. Each one of those domains, say that all the compass needles are, you know, at 270 degrees or like 10 degrees or whatever, you know, call that an ego or, or a self with a little s, okay? So, so what all these things are doing, political parties, all these kind of coalitions, they are really discovering themselves with a, with a small s. So if you look at the discovery of the themselves. It's not like people think. People think that it's all monolithic. And so, if you, for example, take some ideology, say conservatives, right? And you say, well, conservatives are the opposite of, you know, say, communists. Then you start out like this and you say, no, I don't see it at all. I say, why? Well, if you go to Texas where the people are Christian conservatives and stuff and look at them, I'll tell you, I'll find more communism 
on a Sunday afternoon in Texas than you will ever see in Russia during the Soviet era. And what I mean is, you can go around to a church fete, people will be helping each other with their, you know, helping their neighbor with their roof. They will be doing a potluck at the church and nobody would, ins would absolutely, nobody would take payment at all. They're all mutualists helping each other out. They are absolute freaking communists. They help each other. But where do they draw the boundary? They draw the boundary of the people that are in their church parish or the guys that have this, you know, maybe a little bit more um, people that have the same skin color as me, <laughs> something like that. But you see how their boundaries disintegrate fast. But that, that where they draw, where they communists, they communists around their self. And their self is in, in Texas, it's like, it's, it's, it's my church. <laughs> You know? But within that church, they're extreme communists. So then communists come along and say, oh, these guys are the enemy because they're individualists and stuff. And you say, well, well, what's the difference? Well, the the communists are in, you know, idealistic Marxists. They're really saying the self is everybody. So the self is the, the entire world population, all colors and creeds and stuff. And they're saying we all must behave like conservatives in a Texas church on a global scale. <laughs> but the only difference is the size of what they're calling themselves. So it's, it's the vision of self is, is the breakdown. So again, you know, you have this thing about, oh, Nazis are not socialists. They're, they're socialists in name only. That, that's the, the cant on the, on the left side. Horseshit, really. They, they, it, you know, the Nazis are national socialists, exactly what they said. So they say, now people's hair gets on fire and they explode and stuff because, you know, they say, no, Nazis are the exact opposite to what we are. No, they're the same thing except for national. So Hitler said that the folkish movement, that's the folk, the people, the self, said the folkish movement is Nazi, is national socialism, is, is Nazism. And he said Nazism is the folkish movement. So he said there's no difference. And, but the folkish movement saying it's all blood and soil is, uh, was the case, especially saying if you're German and you wear Lederhausen and you, you know, grew up with a pine tree and yodeling with uh, Heidi and stuff, tender goats, then, then then you are authentic German and you're part of the self. Then within that self, yeah, the guys are immaculate socialists. <laughs> so always in all these ideologies, it comes down to where they draw the boundary of self. And that's, I think that's where the, the problem of the, the, the horseshoe theory comes in. But now say, so, well, where do we, uh, you know, enlightened people draw, draw the boundary of self? And you say, well, it's it's transcendent. It's beyond all those people's conception of self. It's beyond the the collective human's idea of self. So even the communists fall down because they say, you know, oh, well, we're all big one family and we should all be egalitarian. And they're all very intellectual about it in this conception of of this ideology. But there is that what they miss is they end the boundary of self at humanity. And so they rotten ecologists. If you, <laughs> if you go to the Soviet Union and stuff, they just strip mining and they, you know, basically the com Soviet Union was awful for, for the ecology, the world's ecology and Russia in particular. And the reason is because they were obsessed with this boundary of self around humanity and say, well, no, come on, man. What about the bears and the, the fish and the trees? Wow, that's really yeah, profound. <laughs> that's really profound and spiritual and ecological at the same time. The boundaries of the self. Yeah. Who so are we? What are we? And how far do we extend? That's why Desiderata number one is know thyself. Yeah. Well, um, DGR, I think they're in the right direction. Um, bright green light, they kind of get into it's more than just humanity. So, yeah. Yeah. 
I, I like that. I like that. But it's not even something you reflect on. It's something you know. <laughs> well, you know it by getting rid of all the shit. You can yeah. you know it by getting all, all the. It basically, you say, you know, is am I a communist? No, <laughs> I mean I can get rid of communism. No, but I mean the, the inclusion, the inclusion of things that are beyond the self, is something that is that you know is a, a person, a, a, a person of the Communist Party and Soviet Union who decided to to, to strip the land and to, um, had has not had not accessed had not accessed something that is. That is obvious normally to to to, to the self, to, to to humans, to to us, and I mean that that's that you know that that concept I meant is uh, should is well we wouldn't be here if it was not obvious. We wouldn't be talking together if this wasn't obvious. Ah, okay, it's obvious, but it's denied. So you can only get to it with a long process of reason and deduction. So what you're saying is absolutely true, but it's the overlay. It's the overlay we put on top of it. So, so we've talked ourselves out of exactly what you know. And the only way to get back to it is, is with a kind of cognitive therapy, where you, where you have to reason your way back to that. And the, that, that's the process of neti, not neti. It's not this, not this. So you, you have to, because, Basically, the devil has introduced this into the world. You have to deal with it. You cannot. You cannot just say, "Well, we'll we'll wish our, ourselves back to Eden." We have eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the the only way forward is you reason out good and evil until it's exhausted. It's the only way you can get get back once you've lost your innocence. You can't just wish your innocence back again. Mm -hmm. So so you have to do the process of philosophy to, right. to get back to the truth yeah and i think part of that denial is um especially people living in cities and in in you know civilization we're separated from nature we don't see all that strip mining i mean just reading that book right green lies i, I really recommend it they really go into yeah, detail well, oh man actually, actually asked Leah, there's a website. She's, she recommends um <sighs> Oh, yeah. Two websites to get the book. Um, it's, yeah. it's, I think because it doesn't go into. Yeah, it's um, mm -mm. things things that we don't. Well, I don't see at all because I'm so far away from you know the dams, uh, the habitats that are being destroyed. It's so, yeah. so you you're not actually you're not you know they hide all this shit. You know, I, I right. was, um, exactly. I, I lived in Tiburon, right, <laughs> um, in in San Francisco. And across the bay, there was this this group called the uh, Duruti, Duruti Construction. They built the extension for the San Francisco um, airport. So basically this dual runway. It's basically like Heathrow expansion for English people. And, and it was done out into the San Francisco Bay. Now, I was kind of... Curious, I thought, like, where the fuck did they get all this fucking building material? Uh, because, you know, I realized it must be a fucking, uh, you know, must be a disaster, of ecological disaster. So I traced, I happened to commute on the ferry, so it was kind of easy. <laughs> I, I managed to figure out where these barges were coming from. And they were coming right across the bay right from Redondo, uh, not Redondo, uh, Mill Valley, just right there in Mill, Mill Valley. I thought, what are you talking about? So so then I made a little, we did a little family excursion to go and find out. And there, there is this huge mother big crater, like it's, it's like the size of San Francisco that they've hidden right next to this freaking park. You can see it on Google Earth um, uh, in San Rafael. And so I thought, how is this possible? They, they, this is prime real estate that they just <laughs> they gouged out. And then it, it didn't cost them a lot because they just put it on barges to went to San Francisco airport and dumped it. And, and so I thought, how did this, this happen? I went back and looked at it. 
they got planning permission from all the guys in San Rafael because they just weren't honest. They just they just they planted all these trees and they built up this whole um, these burns and stuff so nobody could see the the thing. And then they got planning permission through you know the council and stuff. They just paid for golf courses and shit like that <laughs> and then they bought off the local people and told them that it they were landscaping then they did the park next door they did this tiny little park nice park but it was just you know, one tenth of their land and then they just took nine tenths and just fucking went through they went through the fucking water table so so they got to i'll, I'll just finish this little story off with telling you about it the the final irony is is I, you know, they, they weren't going to fill it back in or do anything. And so I was thinking maybe I should start a campaign to say, like, make the bastards fill it in. If they had to fill it in, they would have gone bust. You see, that, that's how all these mining things work. If they had to re restore what they damaged, they wouldn't have made the problem. They wouldn't, they would actually be in debt. And that's everything. That's everything. That's everything on our whole planet. It's all false accounting. So, you know, Bill Gates and all these guys and Elon Musk say, we're going to, you know, do electric cars and we're going to mine titanium and stuff. What they're not saying is if Elon Musk paid for what a Tesla is worth, in other words, if he had to really restore his mind, he says, yeah, we'll all restore them and stuff. Horseshit. They're not going to restore those things. They're just going to basically cover over a bit of mess. They're just going to basically put, sweep on what they've done under the carpet. But the, if they did clean those things up, the, then the Tesla would cost millions. And they don't tell you that. So basically what they're doing is they, they're defrauding future generations to get a Tesla out now and then they tell you it's green. But that, that Duruti group, I'll just finish the story of telling you the final thing. But So the Duruti group, once I found this mother big hole, I realized they can't dig anymore. The San Francisco airport was finished. And I thought, I, this is a business opportunity because the, this, there's this huge thing that it, it, it was a, like an amphitheater, a monster thing like an amphitheater, and it was filling up with water in the center. So there was a small cut where the, the guys came, uh, you know, basically loaded up the, the barges. And I thought, hang on a minute. If you just, you know, make a small channel there, you could make a yacht basin. You could basically all this amphitheater, you could put a wonderful village, you know, like a Greek village. It could be the fucking best thing in San Francisco. So I started down this path and say, try and get the land and stuff or find out what the, the Derudi group would do. When, when they heard that I knew about the money hole, they did their nut. And basically, yeah, they, 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 uh, they did everything they could to, to basically stop it. They said there was no way in fucking hell that they would sell, sell that land and, you know, basically just try to shut me out. But the, the weird thing is, you can see this monster if you look on Google Earth. It's just they, they're very clever how they planted. They did landscaping and beautified it all in a room right on the ridge. And so nobody in San Rafael right there knows that this has been done on their doorstep. Now, the same applies to you down there in, in, um, in L.A. and stuff. Is mm -hmm. You know, the, the lakes and stuff, you know, it's like Mulholland. He went around from lake to lake. Just, just basically building a pipe, which is like a big straw to San Francisco. It just drained the lake. Absolutely. It went one after another. And he, the, the biggest dust bowl in the world, it actually changes the climate. It's so freaking big. But it's this fine talc powder that comes out of, uh, you know, um, there near, near Mount Baldy. I can't remember what the blasted thing is called. But now it's just a huge pan. And when the wind gets up, the thing goes right into the stratosphere and goes <laughs> and circles the earth. Now that environmental disaster was Mulholland just because he, he drained the water out. But Mulholland went all the way around, you know, getting further, the cheapest water first, obviously. He went all the way until he got to Lake Tahoe. And he was about to lake, drain Lake Tahoe. And then even the worst of the worst of these capitalists said, whoa, dude, not Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe is the most pristine alpine lake in the world. But Mike was, saying that, uh, Mike was saying that when people live in urban uh, settings, they're absolutely unaware of what's going on. And now that there's more than 50%, I'd say, well, nearly 50% of the planet, 
and in certain countries it's probably 70 or 80 percent of people who live in in urban centers um this this awareness even this awareness this is a word i don't like <laughs> but uh, this knowledge is uh, is completely lost to most people that's why you find the block when you talk to people about ecocide and and environmental murder and assassination of of, of na the natural world and and uh, yeah i've started bright green new lies uh bright <laughs> oh jesus i'm too tired to say anything today but yeah i've started it and i feel the anger in the book huh? yeah yeah i see it too well, yeah. well I, I must tell you something about america because you you probably don't understand the mindset in america no the funny thing about you might correct me if you don't agree, but the, the funny thing about the mindset in America, Americans have a very, very funny, strange relationship with nature. So, uh, so you know, it's 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 hard to describe, but I'll, I'll okay, so going back to Lake Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, you know, the most pristine alpine lake in the world. It's just beautiful. And, and but if you go up there, I was, I, I was incensed. I went up there and I was swimming with the kids and stuff. And you just get, you know, you know, person after person just coming past in like this bit of machinery, any bit of machinery, you know, a jet bike or a st or a, a speedboat or anything, and they bam, 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 and, the, and it's you know, it's it's beautifully quiet and tranquil. It's just fucking heaven. And these guys are gonna beat it to death. They they actually feel. I think Americans feel um, challenged by death. There's something deep deeply psychologically they're antagonistic towards like mother nature so they're almost purposely beating her to death it's kind of like mommy issues it runs so deep and so so they le they left an oil slick you know they're leaving an oil slick i can't in in europe they wouldn't let a single motorized thing on this lake but but mm. in america it's like they're leaving yeah. freaking oil slicks and stuff in, 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 in europe too people are becoming murderers too like that they they were the last it's changed in the last 20 years i recognize what you say the behavior what you, you describe to ascribe to the americans i'm starting to see it in in a lot of europeans and uh, in in uh, in general too we're, we're going mal psychotic we're going mal psychotic. so they can't stand the silence the guys no, no. Will, they'll crank up the music they yeah. crank up the volume they they the noise pollution is going up because they fear the silence yeah it's, it's chronic psychological problem yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's being unaddressed mm -hmm. so the only way i think to tackle it is is um you know to to start a group like this in okay I've, again it's like you say awareness you know you want to form it when you mm. <laughs> but, but it, it really is awareness not the kind of awareness they talking about like you know well awareness of planetary destruction is like XR's awareness of planetary destruction is not real. It's 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 coming secondhand from David Attenborough and stuff, and it's all and it's all neurosis. Yeah, it's, it's all sentimentality, and it's got nothing at all really to do with nature. But the the awareness you're talking about is the awareness of nature, not awareness of polar bears. The awareness of actually being out in the wild and being able to hear your heartbeat, or you know the stuff that. Derek and, and Leah talks about. So, uh, and and just you now, the only way you can get to that is being comfortable with yourself, you know. And um, and and so there's a long route back, but but uh, we're getting further away and faster. So the more people spend time in virtual reality and these simulators and in these games and online and listening to all the stuff I put out on XR Made, which is like high volume stress stuff, the the more they um, uh, they are struggling um, or the more de detached they're becoming from from nature. So so yeah the reason I put stuff out there is because I to get you to uh, you know dissociate psychologically. But what if if we ever got enough people together and enough people going on, on a project like this, what, what you'd aim to do is to uh, wean people off this stuff and get them back 
um, to sanity, which is to nature and silence. And so they could actually feel the sattva and um, and get it. It's, it's they 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 slaves to rajas and tamas. So tamas, um, because you know tamas is like gravity or lethargy. Hey, hi, Torsten. And um, Rajas is this running around, this completely frenetic, you know, busy, busy, busy stuff. What what we all do in the Western world, we're proud of it. We, you know, basically, if you if somebody says to you like, "Oh, I can't meet you then. I'm busy," you know, they win. <laughs> it's like whoever has the the fullest schedule can like put the other person down. And so we 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 love Rajas so much in the West, but it's absolutely binding us and keeping us away from Sakwa. And until you can break uh, the lethargy of Thomas and just the fr frenetic hypnotization. It, so Rajas is like hypnotization. It's just people are fascinated. Uh, so they're fascinated with technology and they're fascinated with entertainment and they're fascinated with spectacle. And what it's costing them is, is the software. They're getting further and further away. So now they, people have chronic deficits. They cannot sit still for long. They, they cannot uh, shut down the voice in their head. They can't sit in nature without uh, being disturbed. There, there was, I remember, I remember, yeah, just to give you an indication of how fucked up we've become, is, is when I was at school, uh, I mean, we spent all our time out in nature. I grew grew up, you know, spending all my time out on the felt and stuff. And but and and it was true for most most boys. I think that grew up. We didn't have television, and so uh, there wasn't television in the country till 1975. The first time I got television, I was 15. Television in the home, and then it was only on for two hours a day. So the the that was a different era. That was a different way of growing up. So. Where, I remember this thing when we were at school. We were horrified. All all us boys were absolutely horrified by this. Now, hopefully, you can see why why we were horrified, um, and see how far we we've, we've gone. Is we were told the story about one of the early pioneers, the fur trekkers that came from Holland, and so they came on a ship. They were reading the diary of this this woman. And she came, you know, from Amsterdam on a ship, you know, uncomfortable voyage and seasickness, gets to the Cape, beautiful Cape and everything like that. Um, but then the thing that absolutely appalled us was this piece that she wrote about where she, she came over, she's in a wagon, she came over this mountain pass and just had this huge vista in front of her. Just, you know, the purple mountains and these huge plains, which is, you know, South Africans go almost choke because the walls are too close and the sky is too too low in Europe. And and if South Africans miss uh, more than anything, those large distances with the purple mountains and stuff. So the, when she saw that, she broke down and cried. And we were like, no, wait, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> so the teacher explained to us that, that she came from Holland where everything was close and narrow and stuff. And, and so, she, uh, you know, the teacher said, like, you have to understand what she felt, that this vast open expanse is she just felt like nothing. She just smelt, felt small and insignificant and so much so that she burst into tears. And we were outraged. <laughs> we were like, the way to feel, the natural way to feel when you're yeah. when you when you're in nature. Yeah, we we were so outraged because because we said like, how can people live in cities and get to that point where where where, where the oxygen of life and those distances and the blue mountain, which we thought was life, and we said it, it's kind of like we were so appalled that you could get a domesticated chimp and do this to a chimp in in a city, and so. Yeah, I just share that with you, but, but you know, that's we're talking the 17th century. So they were really fucked up by that stage. No, no, because I, I get years ago when I was still when I, even when I was still working, I used to get those those people who would who would well, I live it's very wild and it can be 
they can you can see nobody sometimes for a long time and this vast expanses of ocean and mountains and bog and and i had some people who had to come here working for an, either a government agency or police or medic or whatever sent from the city who regularly broke down in the winter because they they the silence the darkness and and the and the, at night in the winter and also the the huge uh, yeah the, the huge expanse of nature they would they would have breakdowns they'd have to be sent back to the city they couldn't stick it but, but it's, they were completely it's tragedy. And, and and the cities in Ireland are small compared to what you have in certain places of Europe but, but even those people could they would they would just they couldn't adjust but, but here's the tragedy is we, we're going into a, into a situation where I feel that anybody in a city, they, they're in trouble. They're going to, people are going to have to abandon cities, I think, and it's not long. <laughs> and and so, so you imagine the psychological problems, people are going to top themselves left and right. So, I mean, yeah, I say just, if you're talking about crisis risk management get out of a city your your biggest favor you can do to yourself is start to wean yourself off the city before the big rush <laughs> because even even if it's i'm wrong and collapses happen it's like a drug it, it, there is a long period of weeding and it doesn't happen overnight yeah I, i'm telling you you will top yourself you will not be able to go cold turkey uh fast if if you don't learn to to like nature and learn to like uh, being outdoors or be a bit of isolation and stuff if you if you don't learn to like it if it's if it's if it catches up to you in a rush you're in trouble man i'm telling you you'll top yourself so a lot so of the suicide in those conditions yeah a lot so, of people so I'll, I'll tell you what will happen to you, and I'll tell you why you'll tell yourself this, because in in those really desolate uh, areas, uh, you know, real deserts and things like that, you have to face yourself. You have to <laughs> you have to face what goes on in your head. So my my school teacher used to say, my, my headmaster was. Uh, I don't think I'll dox myself here, <laughs> but anyway. Um, uh, yeah, he, he okay. He he was he was in in the Battle of El Alamein, and he had a lot. Of, it was obviously a big deal in his in his mind. But he he said uh, he spoke waxed on about the the Sahara Desert and stuff a lot to, to us boys. And so, and he said one of the things that he found amazing was that you have auditory hallucinations. He said the silence in the desert. He said he he would hear his school bell. We had a school bell, and he um, you know hand run slave bell it was literally a slave bell and the uh he said that he he you know as an adult he would hear his schoolboy um school bell ringing loud and, and that's just an ordinary auditory hallucination and those things happen a lot so much so that alistair crowley would go out into the sahara just to <laughs> confront all these demons and they're, they're really interesting stuff like he says one story with this um this guy who just came over the sand dunes um and just attacked him physically and he wrestled with the guy and you know wrestled hard um kind of like who's the guy in the bible that did that um i can't remember who the guy is who wrestled in the bible uh, jacob or was jacob wasn't it? yeah but, it but jacob? E exactly the same thing as jacob basically wrestled this guy uh almost to a standstill and then the guy just up and ran away again as soon as, as quickly as he, he had arrived and you it, that kind of thing is is very common um it's it's you know it's called a jinn in in uh, in egypt uh, like a demon or a ghost but you talk to anybody that's gone out into joshua in, in like in california or uh, you know basically in the in, in indiana and stuff and those the canyons and stuff and if you spend a long enough time there without people that jabber all the time you you will 
also hear people say stuff like that, that they have those kind of encounters. And th those kind of encounters, you're encountering your own demons. You, you're manifesting your own demons. You'll know, I've said before, when all this, if you get deep enough into this stuff, you will gaslight yourself at some stage. And, and that kind of shit, <laughs> like Alistair Crowley, will happen to you, I guarantee it. But here's the thing. You have to just take it for as it is, right? You you will you will never be able to decide, like Alistair Crowley. Imagine him. He could never say whether this was a, a demon that manifested himself and came, or it was just some demented guy who lived in the desert, or whether he was hallucinating. You you'll never be able to say. You just look back and it's just say it, it's weird, but but. You should expect that kind of thing and and not not be freaked out about it. It's it's part of it's part of this this work. <laughs> I just want to warn you because you see, if people get into this too too deeply, they they go until they get gaslit, and then they go and as soon as they gaslit, they freak out and run for the hills. I'm saying I've I've said so many times, you can't do that. You, you 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 will be really sorry if <laughs> if you do that, and it's unfortunate now because in that uh, Stephen Hazen critique, that long three hour three and a half hour thing I did, he raises that with cults that that they say, oh the cult tells you you can't leave, otherwise bad things will happen to you, and then I'm just doing that now. But you see, he dropped out of a cult. He's a failed cult member, and. It, it, the cults are actually right. I mean, I'm sure there are guys that abuse it, and he was saying, oh, the, you know, some guy's trying to run you down but with a car, but it, it's 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 much funnier than he'll let on. He, I'm sure he knows that if the guys that get run down by a car, it's a lot more complicated than you think. Of course, you'll never get to the bottom of a story like that if you try. So I'll give you an example. So then, you know, say, say this story that he said with some guy you know trying to leave a cult and they said you'll you know something bad will happen to you you'll get run over by a car and then they, they are that is psychological right so you will never find out whether the cult actually tried to run the person down which is a possibility you will never find out if psychologically just kind of like a freudian slip with a kind of a death wish they people will you know walk in front of a car unintentionally all of these psychology because you're getting so deep into the psycho psychology all these things will come up and you, you will never you will never be able to decide was it the cult members and were they being malicious or was it the person that walked in front of a car back and was it synchronicity that the person just you know subliminally saw a cult member in the car and you know stepped out in front of them because of psychological reasons all of those things could could be possible but you'll you'll never find out but it there's such crashing synchronicity and and stuff that you know that it comes with the territory and it's it's spooky and people get gaslit and all i can say is just you know just rise above it and just say hey this is weird territory. After a while, you get you get used to this weird territory, and uh, eventually you get comfortable with it. <laughs> eventually, you get like me and seek it out. <laughs> but you know, there's a lot. There's a big underground subculture of people that do this. They're, they're young people that go um, into haunted places and do kind of Blair Witch Project things. They record it and stuff and, and freak freak themselves out. So, yeah. Been doing this when, when we were teenagers, even in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Before TV. <laughs> I heard about yeah. the, the stalkers in the Chernobyl zone. Like, they just go in there. You heard about them, the stalkers? No, no, like those no. people. Uh, there's a documentary I saw it a while back, but um, you know, there's like a zone you can't enter in Chernobyl, yeah. right? Yeah. So they just go in. Like there's there's a group there's these groups of people that go in and they just hang out there for a week or two weeks, and um, yeah, 
I mean, it's all, it's all wilderness, right? And um, yeah, they, they, they have a thrill in that, just going into that Chernobyl zone. Uh, so, so in that video that, that I was critiquing, there's this, this uh, woman that says she's two-spirit, right, from, from um, First Nation, you know, uh, and the Dakota Access Pipeline stuff she was talking about. She said a whole lot of stuff there, which was completely off message, <laughs> but it didn't really come across. I, I, don't, I don't think the other guys knew what she was saying. What what she said in the she says that you're getting all these guys who are LARPing and they're these cults and stuff, and they're coming into these movements. And she says, and they try. Well, the reason is they're trying to take over hard to reach places. Those hard to reach places, she means paranormal places. So the, what the guys are doing is the same as the guys in Chernobyl, is if you go and do that stuff, you you they they're really psychonauts. They're trying to get, they're trying to accumulate, you know, these kind of um, spiritual experiences. And they, there's lots of people in America doing it too. But if you go to an old you know, Indian burial ground, or you go to Skinwalker Ranch or something, you, that's what they're doing is they they mining all of that stuff and then now all the first nation people and stuff they hate it because it's oh it's cultural appropriation and stuff and yeah it's uh, but that's what she was talking about but it it was off message because what the other guys were trying to say was oh all of these things are crazy all these people are in in you know QAnon are nuts and uh, you know we all rational, <laughs> and then she was coming out with this. <laughs> what she was saying was undermining the whole thing, saying that basically no, this shit is real. <laughs> There's spooks out there. <laughs> it's like shut the fuck up. We're trying to say QAnon is full of shit. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. I should have I should have made more out of that. <laughs> yeah. So was she referring to the Iglesia Ni Cristo? Those um, were yeah. they trying to? Uh, yeah. Okay, now I yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if you go, I mean, you know, like if you just go a bit south and you get to like uh, the Day of the Dead and all of these crazy, you see, all all these guys were heavily into it when when the conquistadors and the missionaries and stuff came around. It never goes away. Those guys are still living in a different psychological landscape. Is again talking about that you'll never get to the bottom of this is is uh, a thing of like yeah I, I I want to try and be a bit edgy and paint the picture don't be too rational about this stuff there is weird shit out there there's seriously weird shit so uh, think of it like um, Everett I, is I was I pondered a lot about David Everett uh, you know Everett went went to the Piraha. And he studied them as the first to translate the, the language. He spent 22 years as a Christian missionary and, and talks a lot about these kind of things. And one of the things that uh, was really fascinating to him was that the Piraha could see ghosts and he couldn't. And he gave one instance of where they were at this river and they see this, you know, ghost across the, on the other side of the river. They, they all could see it and, and he couldn't see it. And he, he didn't have an explanation. He didn't, he, you know, they, they can all see it. They can all describe the same thing without transferring notes. They can clearly, they can all see it. But it's it's not visible um, to him. And it, it's saying, if you are James Randi and these kind of guys and an arch skeptic, you won't be able to see it. Now, that sounds like double talk and stuff. But I, I was like, man, I've tried this shit. You see, it's the same thing. It was like, I, I've been down this road. You try and take photographs of this. You see, people people say, like if it, like Skinwalker Ranch, if you have a look at that, you'll see it. there's this guy called Bigelow, and he tried this path. He tried to get all this paranormal activity and stuff on film and <laughs> use electronics. And he it just wouldn't work. You basically, you wouldn't get it right. The camera would jam, the thing would just, and, and I've done it too. I. And exactly the same thing. You, you will never get the technology to work, so you get a picture of Bigfoot or something like that. And, but it's, it's very funny what happens when you try. One of the things I noticed was 
a equipment malfunction and energy basically the batteries will die you'll never get the to get out into those areas of parent normal activity you've got to be out off basically off grid off grid enough to have batteries as soon as you have batteries you're on an energy budget and you're kind of juggling this budget you'll never get it together to, to get it. and so that's the one thing and the other thing is is i i've taken some pictures which i thought this is going to be dynamite and then I can't find them again. You can't index them on the computer. Basically, they get lost in so much noise. Eventually, you got so, you know got so many files on the computer that when I find it, it's just like not oh, fuck. So I, you try and defeat that problem. You say, well, I upload it to to the internet. I'll stream it to the internet and stuff. And every it, it'll one way or another, you won't get back to it. <laughs> But I just say all of this stuff just mainly so that if it happens to you, you, you know, you're a bit calmer and you don't freak out. <laughs> but a lot, a lot of the stuff that they say is apophenia um, and, you know, therefore entirely illegitimate in the point of view is, is uh, well, it's a little bit reductionist. If you go back and look at those uh, 4chan guys and stuff, what they were doing, especially in like 2016, they, you remember the stuff with Keck the Frog and stuff like that? Those were guys who were going into the Egyptology and they, they were seeing connections everywhere that, you know, all over they would get these synchronicities with numbers and Kabbalah and things. And so, so yeah, they believed that they manifested Kek the frog, which was an ancient Egyptian god. And then, then you know, you know the Kek the frog, the feels bad man meme? Mm, and so, no. yeah, the green frog that's... Uh, oh, uh, Pepe? Pepe, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. And then, then it all came out of fortune, and they all, you know, from this kind of synchronicity and apophenia and stuff, they got to to this meme. And then they, um, uh, yeah, and then the mainstream got hold of it and said, oh, you know, it's a right wing meme and it's all fascist, so we can't, you know, can't talk about Pepe <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the Apophenian stuff is, you, you, you can be a little bit too reductionist about that. It, 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 there's more to it than, you know, P brains like Michael Sherman and stuff uh, can get to, and then there's also the Everett effect that Michael Sherman will never get to it because he's he's just got a block. <laughs> he'll, never, he'll he'll never see a ghost because he just doesn't believe it. So, oh well, anyway, that's a spooky thing. So maybe maybe that's enough. Unless anybody's got anything else. I think that the problem is not about believing or not believing. That, that's where the problem is. With ghosts, is, is which you take that stance that you believe or not believe, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's it's really kind of fluidity, yeah, fluidity of mind. So it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I live in a country where everybody sees them, talks about them, and you know, and it's just like it's just like so many people tell you that you just yeah, it's just like the weather, right? Yeah. But. When you actually see one, then you, you have to say, well, you know, am I hallucinating? Now, if you a Western psychiatrist, you're delusional. And you, you see yeah, but visual delusions. Funny enough, the, the, the psychiatric profession in Ireland doesn't doesn't have a problem with people talking about ghosts or wow. fairies. Or Try that in America. Or, <laughs> you mean, or, yeah. Or, no, no. There's a guy who managed to get a motorway moved because because they were going to construct on the site of a fairy and a holy, well, an ancient tree that had a lot of powers. So the motorway had to go around the place. So there's still in here. It's it's quite serious, um, you know. And it's not that it's serious. It's that it doesn't go into the realm of of psychiatric things um, when you talk certain. Things like that, certain things like that, yeah. You, you know, I don't know about the new generation, they might, but where I live, and it's really one of the most remote places, and the doctors would not have pass any remarks if somebody told them that they're seeing ghosts and that they've seen fairies or they've heard the banshee or, you know. 
things like that. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm from being in Greece, I'm starting to get a new. I, well, I'm, I'm starting to get an, um, more of an appreciation for Orthodox religions because from being in Greece here, I think that it offers some protection, and it's kind yeah. of counterintuitive. You would think that an Orthodox uh, Greek culture would be very oppressive and you know no ghosts and stuff, but it's kind of the opposite because. The, for, for starters, Greeks only have a thin layer of Christianity. They're, they're all freaking pagan if you scratch off the paint. And the, But the fact that you have the Orthodox Church that believes all this weird stuff, uh, it actually permits all the pagan weird stuff. Because you see, if they if they had a complete rationalist American style ban on spooks and ghosts and stuff, well, it would run counter to the church, which is all full of miracles and spooks and ghosts and stuff. But you see, the the, the, the Irish um, uh, blend of of Catholicism is also the same as what you see in Greece, because it, it's very different to the rest of Europe, where they were allowed here to keep an awful lot of things to use the same places. The same holy wells, the same uh, things were, that were pre-Christian. So it, it's a very special brand of, of Christianity, and that kind of seeps into the university and into the, the medical world and everything and the psychiatric world because this kind of blurred um, limit between rationality and, and you know what is just there and the people that are there. You've got this in Iceland too, very much too. It's it's extremely, uh, uh, you, you scratch a little bit and you get you get all the old, all the old beliefs, uh, not beliefs, the old facts, the old things of the land that are there, the mysteries, you know. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's very much the same in Greece. They've kind of retained it all. But, uh, and ritual, rituals but too. It, it's, it's so fascinating because you know, in the West, we psychologically completely fucked up, but we complete rationalists and we don't believe in ghosts and stuff. And then if you, these Orthodox uh, cultures, like in Greece, they believe all the weirdest shit known to man. They're all Kabbalists. They can all, you know, add the Greek letters. They can all tell you what the numbers are for the Greek letters and add them together and get relationships. <laughs> all this kind of gematria and stuff with completely beyond the pale in the in you know a liberal democracy but they psychologically sane so they they more psychologically grounded here here in Greece than any, anybody in America so go figure you got all this weird shit that Dickie Dawkins says like oh it was a pagan weird crap we got to leave it alone it's like yeah but these guys are not committing suicide or going to drugs and they have a social so it's like you know you, 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 rationalism and stuff is not as great as we make out in fact it's a kind of brain disease i think yeah maybe, maybe we should end it on that note <laughs> yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah all right okay all right, everybody well all right. nice, nice to see you all again and so uh, yeah We'll, we'll try to get some, maybe see about Kevin. Maybe see, should, should we talk to Kevin on Friday? I can, I can message him if you like. I'll message him on uh, on his Discord. And uh, yeah, he's, he's open to it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, is it fruitful? Do you think? I don't know why he likes me, likes when I cry. It's really nice. So I just. <laughs> well, no. the, it's, it's basically, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of nice balance because. Kevin is like yeah. the guys club and then like XR and everybody is like the girls club. <laughs> All right. I don't know. Mm, I don't know. I see also complete extreme political. I mean, uh, they're completely two different worlds too. So I don't see it as a gender thing. I see it more like a, it's a, it's another world, the world what, of what Kevin, you, you know, it's just like, I'm on holidays when I go there, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, no, but Kevin's thing is very much a guy thing. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. See you All soon. Right, bye. bye. See everyone. Bye. 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 bye.